Thank you, Nirusha. Thanks a lot. Uh, hi, everyone. So, like, let me thank Nirusha for inviting me to share my research uh, with the participants in the first uh, Algoma University Research Week faculty lunch box talk. Uh, box talk. Uh, what it calls. So let me thank our VPR as well for organizing this um, research week for the first time. And thanks for those who are attending. Uh, my presentation uh, actually has two areas. Uh, first, I will talk about who I am and then what my research interests are. And then I will briefly talk on Northern Ontario labor market and migration problems and policy. So you see my name uh, is Nusrat Aziz and um, I'm associate professor in School of Business and Economics and a fellow of Global Labor Organization and a member of International Migration Research Center in Wilfrid Laurier University and a research associate of Nordic Institute at Algoma University. So uh, my past major affiliations were with uh, University of Birmingham, England, University of Bath, England, uh, University of Nottingham, UK uh, in Malaysia campus, Multimedia University in Malaysia, and University of Chittagong in Bangladesh. So I was uh, uh, an academic and researcher in those universities. Okay, briefly, let me talk about my research interest. So in, if uh, I take a broad category, it is actually open economy, macroeconomics. That's my research area. But if I want to go a little deeper, it is like you see the type here. Number one is migration and labor market, migration, labor market, and trade. Uh, I will give a uh, you know, short talk on that today. And then international economics and international finance, I published in these areas and that was my PhD area. And I also work on climate change and environmental uh, uh, economics. So um, when I will talk about my current and uh, ongoing projects, uh, uh, you will see what are the topics I'm uh, doing research on. My recent research talks were uh, as a guest lecturer, guest speaker, um, was on the COVID-19 crisis and policy, the world economy and Bangladesh. And that was uh, in, in, I mean, uh, Bangladesh Open University invited me in April 2020 to give that talk. And then Thompson Rivers University invited me and um, I gave a talk on impact of international and interprovincial migration in Canadian interprovincial trade. And then I gave a talk in Laurentian University in their research week in 2019 on labor migration and interprovincial trade in Canada. And um, another talk on globalization and international migration uh, that was hosted by Bangladesh Open uh, University 2017. Now, these are my rec uh, recent publications. Uh, so uh, I published recently on uh, do my immigrants fund affect the exchange rate in world economy journal and uh, armed conflict military expenditure and international tourism i work uh, on international tourism as well uh, as kind of a side field so uh, i i published on armed conflict military expenditure and fdi inflow exchange rate hysteresis which is purely my phd area and uh, does the quality of political institution affect intra-industry trade within trade blocks, the role of income and intergenerational co-residence, and again, uh, migration, uh, mi military expenditure, armed conflict, and economic growth in developing countries in the post-Cold War era. So these are the latest uh, recent publications. And my ongoing projects are, um, so these are the projects I'm working right now on these projects. So immigration and sectoral shift in Canadian international trade. Uh, I'm supervising one uh, Western graduate uh, with NOHFC funds I received. And then the topic I will talk on today is uh, Northern Ontario labor market migration problems and policy. And um, 
Sean Mears, the director of Nordic Institute, joined me in this project. So um, I work on Northern Ontario tourism development recovery strategy in the face of COVID-19 pandemic. And Sean, um, Sean Mears is in this project as a co-researcher as well. And we received actually a small shark institutional grant for this project. And a postdoctoral researcher is working in this project uh, as a research assistant. So I'm working on internet, uh, interest rate pass through during the crisis, like global financial crisis and COVID-19 crisis. And um, the impact of like central bank's policy rate on mortgage rate and other rates, that's the topic. And I'm supervising one student, Algoma University students in this project and capital control, financial globalization and investment of OECD countries. It's another project and relative effectiveness of Canadian carbon tax and provincial government expenditure for carbon control. Uh, the paper is almost done. We will submit it soon. And the risk and return on cryptocurrencies, crypto finance. Okay, uh, so let me talk, quickly talk about the governor's challenge program offered by the Bank of Canada. And uh, I initiated the program at Algoma University and we have a team and I, uh, uh, I'm faculty advisor. We participated in 2019, 2020 from Algoma University. And I organize sessions uh, for the Canadian Economic Association annual conferences every year that focuses on Ontar Northern Ontario economic development and research on the First Nations economic development. So let, let's go to the topic and talk a little bit about what I'm doing on this topic, Northern Ontario. So it's uh, a typo here, Northern Ontario labor market and migration problems and policy. Uh, I don't know how much I can cover. It's not much, I believe. So, okay. So Northern Ontario covers actually, uh, Northern Ontario covers over 800,000 square kilometers, which is representing 90% of the total land mass in Ontario. However, in Northern Ontario, there, there is only 6%, approximately 6% Ontarians live in this Northern Ontario. The rest, 94% uh, live in the 10% landmass of Ontario, as you see. So more about the share of uh, population, like uh, share of total population in Northern Ontario is gradually falling. And, um, uh, no, Ontario Ministry of Finance projected that this year, end of this year, the uh, Ontarian number, the percentage of people in Northern Ontario will live like 5.3%. And by 2041, it will be 4.2%. That much declining. And you see the landmass is yellow, right? So that's the big area. But in GTA area, 94% people are living there right now. So uh, why that is happening? There, there is a negative natural population growth. There are two types of growth. One is migration growth, another is natural uh, uh, population growth, right? Uh, negative natural population growth we see in Northern Ontario. We also see a negative net migration in the region. I will show you a figure quickly that will show the figure, um, I mean, the feature of this area. So the only positive growth we see in indigenous population. And we also see the aging population um, in Northern Ontario compared to overall Ontario, 30% 30, 30 in Northern Ontario in overall, including Northern Ontario is 24%. So what is the consequence if uh, the number is uh, gradually falls like that? So Northern Ontario will face a severe, severe uh, labor shortage if pro-migration policy cannot attract uh, immigrants or in-migrants, so provincial in-migrants in Northern Ontario, right? So what it theory says, the theoretical perspective is if you have fewer population, then you have less business, less economic activity, and then you have less employment, less work, right? And then you have people cannot stay here because they don't have jobs. So they will move uh, to bigger cities and you'll see the low demand, aggregate demand in the city or in the, in the area, uh, Northern Ontario. And it goes to the the main point you see again, less business and less economic activity. So this is kind of a vicious circle and we are facing that vicious circle in Northern Ontario. Uh, you see the figure, it shows the Ontario employment rate. You see it's much higher than Northern Ontario employment rate. 
And you see in this figure, this blue line is actually Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, so the Sault Ste. Marie's unemployment rate is, this is unemployment rate, is very, very high compared to other two big cities uh, that like Sudbury and Thunder Bay. And uh, in Canadian average is 6.5%. You see Northern Ontario average is approximately 8% unemployment rate. So uh, it gives the story, like here you see the, why I'm talking about the vicious circle. You see, this is the Ontario. Ontario is the biggest migration hub in Canada, uh, for, for Canada. Uh, you see always positive net migration here, net migration, right? From 20, 2001 to 2016. However, here uh, in Northern Ontario, you see always negative, only the year, uh, small here in 2002, in 20, 2009, it was positive. That was the crisis period. And who knows, I, I think if the data is available, we will see the same scenario now in 2020 because of crisis. So when there is crisis, housing is, uh, housing prices low, so people prefer to come here, right? Um, hi, Nesrati, I'm just going to gently interrupt so that there's time for questions. I realize you have a couple more slides. Uh, the time slot is done at 12.15, so we can get to the next speaker. So anyone that doesn't have a chance to ask questions live, please email or type them in the chat. And thank you very much. Sorry for the interruption. So this is 12.20. So I have to stop here, right? What do you say? Or I can continue. So this, this is a quick slide, if people like. So uh, I, I, rev I visited actually a, a policy uh, which is called rural and northern immigration pilot policy uh, that was implemented, that has been implemented in 11 communities, uh, including Sudbury, Thunder Bay, North Bay, Timmings, and Sault Ste. Marie. And our review was published by the uh, Sioux, Sioux Online and Nordic, right? And uh, Sean Mears was with me. And uh, so we revised, we actually reviewed the policy and we identified that what is the missing, what is missing? I don't explain everything. What is missing in the policy? Uh, the policy has not targeted Algoma University and Sioux College graduates. It's not attracting new immigrants. No, no real plan for business class migrants who creates actually real jobs. Does not have a good plan for attracting and retaining low skilled migrants, which is you see 33%, 36% in, in Sioux Ste. Marie. Uh, 16,000 we can um, accommodate in this low, um, low skill immigration area. So uh, now we are focusing on the primary data and applying, uh, we, we will apply for, for funding and um, uh, wish our luck. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz for this. This is quite uh, an interesting topic that uh, I, didn't, I didn't know much about and I'm sure that other people will share that sentiment with me. I open the floor um, to, uh, anyone who might have any questions, I'm sorry we are short on time, so if you do have any questions, please do use the research office at algoma.u uh, email Elias and or the contact form on the research website. Um, we will move on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Uh, Paulette Steves. Um, we'll give her a moment to jump on and share her uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Uh, Steves will be talking about reclaiming and reviving Indigenous histories in the Western Hemisphere, weaving paths to uh, healing. So I will pass the floor to Dr. Steves, who will give us uh, some insight into her work. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Narosha, for all your great work on creating this research week. Uh, my name is Dr. Paulette Steves. I'm the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous History healing and reconciliation. So my research focus uh, questions archeologists denial of a human presence in the Americas prior to 11,200 um, years before present. In my research, I wanted to gain an understanding of how many archeological sites in Americas have been dated to over 11,200 years before present. So this was during the Pleistocene. No, so North American archeologists have consistently denied the presence of people in the Americas prior to 11 to 12,000 years ago. This has led to archeological sites 
uh, being denied, destroyed, and or ignored, and thus indigenous peoples' links to the land and the deep past to their history being erased. So the questions of early humans in the Americas became really a taboo area. It was a dangerous area for any archaeologist to venture into, or geologist or paleontologist. Anyone who wanted a successful career in archaeology would not say they had found a site older than 11 or 12,000 years ago. So why would archaeologists do this? It's a part of colonization, of erasing indigenous histories. Archaeologists are acutely aware of the possible implications of the early peopling of the Americas, which reflects on contemporary issues of identity, ancestry, and ownership of the past and present. As George Orwell stated, who controls the past controls the present, who controls the present controls the past. So what did North America look like around 11 to 12,000 years ago? Every dot on this map and the larger dots, dots are numerous archeological sites represent where people were 11 to 12,000 years ago. So you can see that 11 to 12,000 years ago, people had covered the entire continent of North America in large numbers. So what I have found though in my research is that there are hundreds of archeology span sites in the Americas that have been dated to earlier than 11,000 years ago. And there is evidence of mammals migrating between the Western and Eastern hemisphere across millions of years. So there's many forms of evidence um, in every area of research. But when we're seeking to answer questions, it's important to consider all forms of evidence and to weave a story based on a holistic view and practice. So on this little map, the green dots are sites that date between 11,200 and 22,000 years before present. The yellow dots are archeological sites that date over 22,000 years before present, some of them over 200,000 years before present. So what are some of these other forms of evidence besides archaeological sites? Well, what do you see in this picture that is distinctly Canadian? You wouldn't think the camels were, but in the sky you see Canadian geese because these camels were in Ellesmere Island over 3.5 million years ago. Camels arose in the Americas. We know they're not great swimmers and we know they can't fly. So they had to walk from their land of origin, North America, to the land we now know as Asia. So that tells us there was a land bridge or a path for them to migrate between the area we now know as North America and the Eastern hemisphere, the area we now know as Asia. So our four-legged ancestors have given us evidence of ways that people traveled or could have traveled between the Eastern and Western Hemisphere. Another of our relations that has provided a great deal of evidence for possible migration routes are horses. Horses also arose in the Americas. They went all over the world. So animals were traveling from the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, to the Eastern Hemisphere, Asia, for millions of years. They had a land bridge. We know distinctly of one land bridge area, and that is between Alaska and Asia. There are other land bridge areas because we know that Arctic foxes have traveled from Norway to uh, Ellesmere Island and to North America across the ice. One other mammal that has um, migrated all throughout the world but originated in North America is the saber-toothed cat, Megateron. So this saber-toothed cat, the oldest for the tribe, was found in Florida. So we know that saber-tooths originated in the present day area of Florida. They not only traveled throughout the Americas, they traveled to the Eastern Hemisphere, once again across land. So what has that land looked like across time? Here's a picture of the North American continent between 22,000 and 11,000 years ago. You can see that it's covered in ice. 
So we have ice in the Western and the Eastern hemisphere for hundreds and hundreds of miles. You have thick ice. You have no sustenance, no food for grazing mammals, no food for predatory mammals and no open sources of water. So this would have been a very difficult time to migrate. Now the Arctic fox has been able to do this because they are adjusted to that ecosystem. But archeologists argue this is the time when people traveled from the area we now know as Asia to the area we now know as the Americas. People were supposed to have traveled through an ice area and that doesn't make any sense. Right? Mammals didn't travel during that time because there was no sustenance. Why would humans? This is the North American continent connected to Asia two million years ago. So there were many times before the last glacial time that uh, the land was a subtropical forest. There was lots of food for mammals. There was lots of water. There was a land connection. So this is when we have evidence of mammals migrating is between glacial periods. So what did the rest of the world look like 2 million years ago in regards to humans? Well, this map shows where early um, Australopithecines and early Homo sapiens were. So we know they were throughout Africa and Europe. We have now found out in the last five to 10 years, they were also in Asia and Northern Asia. So we have human remains and human technology of stone tools in Northern Asia 2 million years ago. So go back to this map. 2 million years ago, people are over here in Northern Asia. Mammals are coming back and forth. There's a land bridge, but we're supposed to believe that humans would have not done that till 12,000 years ago. That doesn't make sense either. So looking at that evidence, like I say, I asked myself, how many sites in the Americas have been dated to earlier than even 12,000 years ago? So even though it was a very taboo subject area to discuss finding a site earlier than 12,000 years ago, there was a small group of archeologists that did an immense amount of work across the last 80 years. And it's their work my research is based on. So when you look at this map, you see that over 22,000 years ago, people were throughout all areas of North and South America based on the archeological evidence. Over 100,000 years ago, we know that we have people in areas of Southern California and Central Mexico. So we find stone tools in areas that are dated between 130,000 and 200,000 years ago. Mainly we find mammalian bone that was broken by humans. So this is one of those sites that I worked on. This is the Lacina site in South Central Nebraska. It dates to 22,061 years before present, calibrated years before present. And in this picture, I'm excavating a little piece of mammoth bone that is eroding from a cliff face. These are tools found in a site in California that has dated to 130,000 years ago. These boulders are what made this nice circular indentation point on this piece of mammoth bone. Humans would bash these large bones with rocks to get the marrow out. There was no mammal alive that, that had a strong enough jaw to break a mammoth bone. These are the, the sites in California that, so we see we have a regional area of sites that date between 50,000 and over 200,000 years. So what does all this mean? My research has shown that the denial of earlier than 12,000 year before present archeological sites in the Americas is political. It is racist and it remains an ongoing practice of a colonial mindset that has worked to erase indigenous histories, diversity and humanity. So the acknowledgement of indigenous peoples to their land in deep time um, is very important discussion that when woven through education and general discussions works to combat racism and discrimination and also works to inform federal and state laws, policy and land claims. Documenting stories on the land reclaims a history that was denied and hidden by colonizing nations and archeologists embedded in state policies of assimilation and erasure. So this research provides multiple forms of evidence and support reclaiming over 100,000 years of indigenous history in the Americas and relinking indigenous people to their homelands, their identity 
and the artifacts held within the land. Currently in my research, I have seven students working on databases of archeological and rock art sites. And hey, I am hiring. So I'm looking for more students. Uh, this is a picture of my book, cover from my book that is coming out in July, The Indigenous Paleolithic of the Western Hemisphere. I intentionally use the term Paleolithic as Western archeologists have denied there was ever a Paleolithic in the Western Hemisphere of the Americas. And now I have maybe four minutes for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Steves, for that great insight into some indigenous uh, histories in the, in the Americas. Um, do we have any questions from our audience? There's a lot of great interest uh, on the book. And as Dr. C Steve said, this is a great opportunity for students uh, to connect uh, and to get some excellent uh, research experience uh, under your belt. Yeah, if any students are interested in working or your friends are interested in learning how we collect data and apply it to issues in contemporary society and how it supports human rights, um, then please just send me an email I'm looking to hire for the rest of spring, summer, and fall. We do have one question uh, from Dr. Rogers. Uh, what is your next major project? <laughs> oh, I'm currently working on a database of rock art sites uh, in just in Canada because there are just thousands and thousands of rock art sites. There's more rock art sites in the Americas than the whole rest of the world combined. Um, so students have so far built a database. We have over 1400 sites and that database will also lead to an educational website and another book, which I'm preparing for the same publisher, University of Nebraska Press. We have a great pun from Dr. Cameron, Aaron Cameron that said this talk really rocked, love puns. <laughs> uh, we have- <laughs> That's we awesome. Have a, Thank we you. have a question from a student, Asil Hashim. Uh, who asks, will we have this uh, book in the book, AU Bookstore? Uh, yes, uh, hopefully we'll have it in bookstores. It's available now for pre-order on Amazon or from the publisher, University of Nas Nebraska Press. If you type the title of the book in, it'll pop up lots of sites where you can pre-order it, and then it will start being sent out on July 1st. Awesome. Uh, we have a comment here from uh, Mark, who also said that the library has ordered a copy as well. So that's fantastic. Oh, we do have thank a, you. We have a question from Bradley, who said, who asked, any job requirements that the students need to meet for the uh, part-time job? Um, just that you be uh, energetic and you be alive and <laughs> um, you're open to reading papers and putting numbers and bits of data in a database. Just uh, you know, a little bit of experience, maybe using Google Scholar and searching for uh, academic papers. But I also trained students. I trained all my students online this year. That worked out very well. And I have some awesome students from computer science. I have another student who's worked with me since I've been here almost three years uh, on the rock art database. So you'd have lots of great peers to work with. Fantastic. Again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Steves. Uh, again, if anyone has any more questions for Dr. Steves, please uh, use the research office uh, email or the contact form on the Research Week website. And again, thank you so much. Thank uh, you for having me. Great. Yep, of course. Um, so we now open the floor to Dr. Pedro Antunes, who's going to give us this great talk. I uh, love the title, The Soil, The Final Frontier, uh, which sounds very next generation. Um, that was a Star Wars reference. Uh, start check reference, sorry. Uh, but all humor aside, take it away, Dr. Antunes. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, yes, we can. Good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, and thank you, Nerosha, for organizing this awesome research week and uh, and for inviting me to give this talk. Yeah, it's a, it's a talk, it's lunchtime, it's a kind of light, and I wanna see if I can inspire some students uh, into getting involved with, uh, with soil. So that's why soil, the final frontier. So, you know, if, if, if we want to become truly uh, uh, to, to, to our civilization, our culture, our history to survive in the long run, 
we do have to become a, a multi-planetary species. And that means that we have to um, colonize other, other worlds and, uh, and the race uh, to be able to do that, to save ourselves, to save our culture, and to learn more about the universe has, has definitely started, right? So, uh, and, and the last few days have been uh, quite staggering. We've been receiving awesome photos from the surface of Mars. And uh, this is an older one. This is a photo taken in 2014 by the Curiosity rover um, of the surface of Mars. And what you see there, you could call it soil, um, but it's not soil. <laughs> it's uh, what we call regolith. And, um, and this is important because when we have plans to send a million people to live over there so that if something happens over here, um, and it has happened before mass, mass extinctions due to uh, when we get hit with me meteorites every so often, or perhaps runaway climate change or um, anything, we want to establish ourselves elsewhere, and then feeding that population becomes important. And all of a sudden, what we call soil in Mars is not really soil, it's regolith. And what is it? And and how then soil becomes the final frontier. <laughs> we need to um, feed that population. And how are we going to be able to do so? And as we do so, or try to understand how we can do that, how, how can that help us also learn and value our own, uh, what we actually have here that it doesn't exist elsewhere, which is soil. And, um, and so, you know, this is definitely something that now is more and more uh, on the media and uh, you see Elon Musk uh, developing all these new uh, companies and uh, really trying to get uh, up there with reusable rockets and all that. And this week we have the first biologists machine getting into Mars, just showing that biology is also so cool right now. You know, that's not a geologist like Curiosity. This is a biologist. It's a field biologist that we have there is going to actually start looking into the regolith in detail and trying to see um, what happened there. Is there, how much of a soil is that? And if there's soil, there's going to be some organic matter somewhere. How much water is there um, and, uh, and microbes? So the, the, this is important because when we get there, um, you know, I was <laughs> then now, now what, right? So as I mentioned, uh, there is uh, on earth here, our soil has a very different composition. It has mineral matter and has organic matter and has air and water. Whereas over there it's mineral matter and maybe a little bit, tiny bit of free freezing water or frozen water. It doesn't have any, any, any organic matter, at least that we know of, it would be get oxidized. Also, the pH is very different. So people here on, on Earth are trying to, and there's some papers that have come out when 2014, when 2019, where we use um, what's what's called simulants. Um, and, and and we try to grow plants in this in these soils. And what you can see is that this first experiment. Uh, a number of plants were, were tested and you look at their, um, how many of them were alive after, after, after 50 days or how many produced flowers after 50 days. And, and, and you could see that not very many actually grew. They didn't grow that much and, uh, and it wasn't very good. Um, but they did grow, they grow a little bit and this is on earth. So this was also not completely sterile by the time you do it. And then in a subsequent experiment where we use the simulants of Mars soil and moon soil, we, we actually, we've brought some rocks from the moon. We don't have Mars soil, we have simulants. Actually, this new rover is gonna bring some, some soils uh, back, not this rover, but this taking samples and another one is going to pick them up and bring them uh, into earth on, by 2030. So we can actually take a, a closer look. But what differentiates this one, the data from the left to the right, um, where you know Earth soil is compared with uh, with Mars and soil and regolith for Mars and and from the Moon is that yeah you know what we actually grow able to grow these plants, but we had to include from here to here we included life, we included organic matter, so we pretty much altered. And so the difference between uh, the left and the right is actually what we study in, in our lab, right? It's trying to, we study the importance of what 
makes life possible because of soils. And uh, so that's, I just wanted to make that point across um, as I tried to think about why, why are soils, how, you know, how, why, why, why wouldn't the student get, get excited about soils? There's everything to get excited about soils. So one of the things we, we do uh, study is the um, relationship between soil microbial communities and, and invasive plants, for example. That's a big topic in our lab. Um, and so now we're dealing with soils and soils life and, and soil life, and we're dealing with invasive species. And invasive species is a problem that just keeps getting bigger. It's a global change problem. It's a problem that is associated intimately with human health. Uh, we know that when we have the introduction of invasive species, for example, mammals, when we introduce pythons to the Everglades, it pythons, they ate a lot of those animals, mammals that were there. And so there was a lot, a lot, a lot less hosts for, for mosquitoes, for example. And mosquitoes ended up feeding all in one rodent that happens to have viruses that infect humans. And I could give you examples from plants with Lyme disease. And so it's not just about humans, but the, what we are experiencing with pandemics and with, uh, with, with the destruction of biodiversity and invasive species is a huge problem in, uh, in terms of uh, ecology, but also biosecurity. And it's growing. And you can see here in this data, all these uh, curves going up uh, in terms of, um, of the number of alien uh, species that are being introduced over time. So one of the things that we do in our lab is to think about, okay, where do we invest resources and uh, what happens ecologically when species are first introduced and over time, uh, what happens? Uh, first, we know that when they're introduced, there's a lag time and then there is an exponential growth phase. And then what happens? Invasion could be persistence, but uh, we don't know what the temporal dyna dynamics uh, is going to be. So, so we, we're trying to, to, to predict what's going to happen based on uh, biotic interactions. You know, I'm not going to really get into this too much. There's a lot of hypotheses in invasion science out there, hypotheses. So basically, why are, why, why are, are some species more successful than others? Why are species that get introduced? Why do they become invasive? Could be because of biotic interactions, could be propagial pressure, could be their traits. Uh, there's resource availability issues and there's evolutionary issues that are all addressed by, by hypothesis uh, around um, like Darren conundrum and I'm not gonna get into any of that. This is actually a really cool new summary. You can actually click on these um, on their website, you click on them and you see how many of these hypotheses have been supported or refuted based on the available literature. So we're seeing a lot more of these databases where you can uh, incorporate a ton of a ton, a ton of data to to make informed decisions. Um, where we focus more is on on biotic interaction, the biotic interaction clusters. And uh, in here, you see some hypotheses that have already, there's enough papers that we can either support or refute them based on a lot of, a lot of data. Now, one of the things though that, that we've, we believe it's missing is actually, I'll go back here, it's here, new associations. When these species come into um, new environments, they start associating with, with other, with new organisms. Uh, making new friends and also new enemies. <laughs> and so we're trying to understand that, right? So new relationships between non-native and, and native plants can positively or negatively influence the establishment of non-native species. So one of the things that we're working on right now is, okay, so the species comes in, but it's going to start making new friends and new enemies, um, and these are pathogens. So over time, is going to the invasive is going to either persist or it's going to start getting sick sometimes perhaps and the populations will decline. Now, having this information and being able to predict this is really important to make decisions because there's limited resources and we have to be able to say, you know, let's invest in controlling this species. Maybe this one we can wait because it might decline. So over the last few years, that's the work we've been doing in the lab. Um, starting here, 
with uh, work by my student Nicola Day. She's now a, a professor, just got a position this year at the University of Victoria in Wellington and she moved to New Zealand. She came from New Zealand to work at Algoma and now she just got a faculty position at uh, in, in, in New Zealand back, back, back home. And we looked at the temporal dynamics of root associated, associated uh, fungi um, throughout uh, invasion. And uh, so what actually we did uh, or she did, you know, is to collect roots of this uh, Vincitoxicum rossicum. It's a, a dog strangling vine that, especially in Southern Ontario, it's everywhere, but it's, we know, we also did some research. We know it will be just a matter of time that, before it hits uh, Northern Ontario. A lot of invasive species will, will hit Northern Ontario, unfortunately, um, if we don't obviously do something about it, but that's another story anyway. So we collected, uh, uh, we used the time, uh, space for time substitution, and we were able to collect uh, samples and use next generation sequencing uh, um, methods to look at uh, extract DNA from these plants and determine if they have pathogens or not, and whether or not there's more pathogens or that we would find more pathogens in areas where this plant has uh, been for over a hundred years. Um, and surprisingly, actually, with this plant, we didn't find uh, increased numbers of pathogens as the populations get older. So um, it, it means that uh, perhaps this is one of those species where we want to be really controlling and paying attention because it's taken 100 years and it really hasn't made uh, uh, enemies capable of, uh, of, of, of destroying these populations. Uh, more recently, uh, we were working on uh, communities. Again, we use in our lab, and, and more and more I want to, to bring in the novel uh, next generation sequencing technologies. I know it's 12 minutes, I'll, I'll be wrapping up soon, um, which allow us to look at these uh, plants and, and, and see all the bacteria and organisms that are there. And now we could even do that, start to do that in real time with a sequencer that fits on the palm, palm of my hand um, and can cost as little as $1,000. Things are really, really changing dramatically uh, um, in, in, in this capacity. So what we did here, uh, actually we went to, to a, a plant community that had all these plants here, they have different names, doesn't matter. The, the orange ones are exotic species and uh, the green ones are native species. You see there's a lot of more exotic species in our plant communities today than than, than, uh, than, than, than natives. And we actually looked at uh, the, the, the DNA sequences inside these plants and we found that um, there's not really a difference in terms of pathogens, meaning that potentially this, uh, uh, this potential pathogens have already started to naturalize in these exotic plants. But we do find there's this group of fungi that are beneficial they that the plants that are exotic actually don't associate with these beneficial organisms as much. And, uh, and also the ratio of pathogens to beneficial organisms is higher in exotics than natives. So there's here a change that could potentially uh, result over time in more and more exotics become dom becoming dominant in communities and excluding the native plants. So um, that was one of, the, uh, uh, one of our, our studies. More recently, uh, just this year, actually a couple of months ago, we, we Catherine, a uh, student who's just uh, now started as a PhD student at Georgia Tech, she um, was able to look at gar dog, uh, uh, sorry, uh, garlic mustard is a plant that, uh, that we find uh, around here, even in our forests, our urban forests. And uh, we were able, there's, we looked at, again, different fungi inside the, these plants. Uh, in different populations. But what you see here is what happens in invaded and or uninvaded areas. So, and uh, when we look at uh, native plants, the roots of native plants, and we see that in invaded areas, there's a lot more pathogens that they have, which means that this plant, uh, invasive plants that can form these monocultures and associate with a lot of fungi that are not harmful to them, but because they are they're co-evolved with native plants. They're gonna spill over and infect native plants. So that was a uh, it's, um, it's interesting data. And with all of this data, we're now starting to think: okay, how do we go forward over the next five years? Um, and so we're doing some work on uh, traits to try to predict um, 
what plants may be more susceptible to, to these pathogens. So if we think, for example, of a plant that has like very large leaves, it's going to probably be a lot more attacked. There's more surface area than a plant that like pine trees that has needles that, that uh, um, and, and heck, may have other traits, chemical traits that make it more resistant to these potential associations with enemies. So we are looking into this in detail, and I'm going to wrap up. And um, yeah, so and coming up with a with a framework to to address this. Um, so yeah, soils are very complex, and come work with us because we do awesome things. This is all our students here in the fall collecting soil for a new experiment that Karina is doing, and. Uh, our funders, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I took some questions, but I know I have no time. <laughs> That's okay. We, we have the, the chat box and uh, the research office. I'll field you any questions that we do get. Um, uh, so thank you again, Dr. Antunes, for that very thought-provoking talk. It's super in line with some issues that are happening in our environment today. So thank you uh, for that and your time. No problem. I thank do you. want to take yeah, I, I do want to take a moment, to, as Asma pointed out in our chat, and my apologies for not highlighting this earlier, is that Dr. Steves and Dr. Nunez are our very own Canada research chairs, and which we're very uh, proud of. So this is a great opportunity, again, for students to connect with uh, these faculty members and get super diverse and awesome experience. So um, thanks again, uh, Dr. Nunez. Um, up next, we have Dr. Obanji Akinola, who's going to talk to us about the integration of international students at Algoma University uh, in our wonderful city of Sault Ste. Marie. So the floor is now yours, Dr. Akinola. Thanks a lot, uh, Nerosha, for your very uh, kind introduction. I, I hope you guys, everybody can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you okay. nice and clear. Um, first and foremost, I'm, I'm presenting after two uh, Canada research chairs. I mean, uh, there's a little bit of pressure, you know, that comes with that kind of uh, thing. But again, more than happy and encouraged and inspired by the work of the two Canada research chairs, Dr. Steves and uh, Dr. Antunes. Uh, thank you so much for your work. And again, to all faculty doing work in that area and other areas, thank you. Now, let me also mention, uh, thanks a lot, Nerosha, for putting these together. And I also want to thank uh, the Office of the Vice President of Academic and Research, uh, Donna, Tiff, uh, Tiffany, and uh, Daniel. Now, by the way, about um, three weeks ago, I'd actually reached out to uh, Tiffany, uh, asking, Tiffany, can we put together a presentation? Uh, I want to present some of my findings from this study. And uh, she had mentioned, oh, uh, that this is actually going to happen. The research week is happening. And I said, wow, fantastic. Let me jump on that train. And I'm more than happy to be here. I'm hoping also, because I don't think I can share everything I'm finding and what I will find uh, as I wrap up this uh, study uh, in this particular context. So I'm hoping in the next few weeks or months, I will be able to present to the university community and, uh, and beyond what I'm finding. And I haven't said that uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, everybody. I will share my screen and hopefully leave some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. Now, my talk today um, will bother on what I've been finding out of my ongoing research. Uh, just give me a sec. Let me present this. And uh, OK, there we go. So this research is tied to the, this particular presentation is tied to the integration of international students at Algoma University and in the city of Sault Ste. Marie. Now, my name is Olabanji Akinola. I'm a professor of political science, uh, the law and politics department at Algoma University. And uh, it's a pleasure to also be part of this community to learn about what's going on and also be able to contribute to that. So the first thing I want to also make clear is this. Let me make some acknowledgement and appreciation. So to be clear, this particular presentation is based on findings from ongoing research project titled investigating the markers and means of integration, uh, the case of international students in Sault Ste. Marie, Northern Ontario. The research project is funded by the Algoma University Research Fund and I wish to acknowledge and appreciate the support of the university for the project through the AURF. Now, this funding has allowed me to um, employ two awesome 
research assistants who also happen to be international students. Uh, one of them being Nidia Mohamed, she's a second year double major student in law and justice and political science with minor in French and the other, and she's from Ghana. The other student uh, research assistant that helps me out on this project is Sawit Abegunadine, uh, a fourth year biology student with specialization in uh, health sciences. Uh, these two individuals have really, really helped me out and it's been fantastic working with them. Let me also lastly thank every person who has participated so far in this study. Uh, your time, your energy, uh, your contributions have been immense in uh, definitely making this experience and this finding so far a great one. Now, going into the talk itself, quickly background of the study. Between 2010 and 2020, the number of international students in Canada increased by 135%. That's according to the Canadian Bureau of International Education. And as of 2020, that's last year, there were 530,000 540 international students studying at all levels in Canada, 46% of whom are in Ontario, according to the CBIE. Now, let me quickly also mention that that number also disproportionately uh, falls in favor of the students who, uh, of the universities who are uh, in the southern part of the province. Now, the case of Algoma University, our own day Algoma, also shows that during the fall of 2019, 2009, that's uh, uh, about 11 years ago, Agoma University had 89 international students from a few countries. But in the fall of 2020, that's just last fall, we had 1091, that's uh, 1,091 uh, 1, international students from 51 countries from across uh, the world. That's a huge, almost, uh, if, I, if my mathematics is, is, is right, almost. Uh, um, a thousand percent uh, uh, within uh, a decade. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, what is this research about? The main purpose of this uh, study is to understand the integration of international students in Sault Ste. Marie, Northern Ontario, based on the case study of international students at Agoma University. Now, for analytical purposes, again, one cannot do all. Uh, you have to be specific in the context of research. Uh, owning in on the specific experiences of integration with regards to education, employment, housing, and health of international students uh, at Agoma University is what this seeks to achieve. The main research question I'm, I'm investigating is that uh, how do international students integrate on and off campus in Sault Ste. Marie? Now, this research also, let me be clear focuses mainly on Agoma University student on the Sault Ste. Marie campus. So within the city of, I look at what's going on, what the integration into the city itself and the, the integration into the Sault Ste. Marie campus. Methodology and uh, data collection analysis. I, I'm using a mixed method approach to find out information about how international students are integrating. Most of my data collection approach have been through semi-structured interviews. I'll talk a little bit more about that and the focus group discussions and the data analysis is done through mostly interpretive analysis. In other words, I get to understand from a very multi-subjective perspective of faculty, staff, students, and community members. And then I, I, I apply my interpretive uh, analysis to that. So far, uh, this is the summary of what I've done. And uh, interestingly, this has all been online. Okay, folks, so please, uh, this is some other interesting piece for me to understand. When I first set out to do this research and I put in the proposal, there was no COVID and I didn't plan to do anything online. But again, uh, one has to be adaptive and flexible in terms of trying to achieve this uh, kind of uh, research objectives. And then I submitted uh, research uh, modification to the ethics and it was approved that I could do it online. And so far the study has conducted a total of 85 semi-structured interviews. Uh, the background of interview participants is as follows. I've interviewed 38 current international students of Agoma University. I've also interviewed six former international students, two graduates and four transfer students. Those transfer students, uh, one transferred to another college and uh, three others to the other universities in uh, uh, Ontario. Now, why did I go 
make sure that at least I made that distinction uh, or actually even talk to transfer students and former grad. I wanted to know why the transfer student left uh, 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 to, to get a sense of how, how that is playing out. Now, I've also, because I try again to make this a very inclusive research, um, I've interviewed three, uh, nine current domestic students, the three indigenous students and six non-indigenous students. I've, in, uh, I've interviewed one former domestic student, 10 faculty members, two part-time faculty and eight full-time across the three faculties, 18 administrative and support staff of Agoma University and three community members and stakeholders. And as I mentioned, these uh, interviews have all been online on Zoom, Google Meet and through telephone and they've been conducted between September 28, 2020 and February, 20, uh, 20, February 22, 2021. In addition to that, I've also conducted three focus group discussions uh, with former international students, current international students, and domestic stu uh, and former domestic uh, domestic students. The first step, GD had four participants: uh, two former international students and two former domestic students. The second FGD had three participants, all international students. The third FGD had uh, three participants. Again, all these um, also have been online through uh, Zoom. Some of the preliminary findings, uh, hopefully as I move towards the end of this the research, uh, sorry, the end of the presentation is that uh, on education, international students at Lagoma University are integrating well into Canadian education system and overall are satisfied with their education at Lagoma University. One of the students uh, put it this way, and I would like to uh, read that out. I love my education at Algoma University. That was the word the student used. And I found that very um, uh, opposite because uh, the student really spoke from the heart. Now, international students like the small class sizes and the fact that they can easily approach and interact with faculty and staff. Algoma University uh, international students are engaged with learning about indigenous people, history and cultures in Canada. Now, this is very key. Because as I said, this is very important for me, particularly for this research to be as inclusive of the indigenous aspect of things. And one of the aspects I really tend to ask uh, questions about in my interviews is how much of uh, indigenous population, indigenous history and cultures and about the people are international students coming from outside Canada learning about uh, uh, indigenous people at Agoma University, again, giving our special mission uh, but beyond that, it's important that uh, we understand how international students are absorbing the, the indigenous aspects of life uh, and understanding how the indigenous views uh, are, are represented in the Canadian context. Now, one of the interesting pieces is that they are not, very, not just very engaged, but many of them actually did not know anything about indigenous people until they got to Agoma. Now, another very striking finding about this particular idea is that some of them had come, some of the international students had come to Canada as international high school students and had studied in Southern Ontario. And when I asked them, do you know, uh, or were you taught about this in most of the, or some of the uh, schools down South? They say, absolutely not. That much of their knowledge uh, about indigenous people is taking place at Algoma. They take classes, they, are, they attend uh, power. And, and some of them mentioned also going with the career center, the career link program to Garden River to participate in some of the activities there. So with, which is pretty uh, impressive, but again, there are much more to be done uh, in that aspect. And again, probably in the full ad, uh, uh, presentation down the line, I'm able to share that. Now, some of the students also- Dr. Akinola, we're just, you're out of time. Um, okay. So I'd like you to be able to, you know, wrap up nicely so that we can get to the next session. And I want to ensure there's questions. So just giving you that quick window, sorry for interrupting you. And Fantastic. remind you, all of the presentations will be uploaded to YouTube, including um, this presentation. Thank you. Fantastic. I have just about two slides to go. Uh, so, so thank you so much. So yes, uh, some of them would like you to be a little bit more uh, engaging uh, and a bit intellectually challenged. But again, employment wise, they would like to have more opportunities on campus. Employment is very key to international students uh, who want to come to Agoma. Most of them just work for the, uh, to, to pay their rent and take care of themselves. Now quickly about housing. Um, generally, most students tend to stay on campus when they come, but then move off campus afterwards. Uh, they generally uh, make friends and then find accommodation uh, uh, off campus. And again, the health-wise, 
Many of them don't know where the doctor's office is on campus. That's a key uh, concern here. And uh, some have also used the uh, um, facilities off campus. Now, the other findings, uh, faculty, staff are really exposed to international students. The one of the staff mentioned that diversity is important. They bring the world to us. And of course, uh, students feel safe on campus and some of them would like to become Canadian citizens. Finally, thank you for listening, Miigwech. Wow, Dr. Aknola, thank you for that great talk. Uh, super re relevant research, especially to our um, Algoma University community. I'm looking forward to seeing your uh, work that's gonna be uh, disseminated in, our, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, thanks again for that. Uh, again, if any more questions, feel free to send us an email or um, use the contact form and we'll share that with Dr. Akinola. Great, thank you. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Nicholas Rulo, who's going to share his work uh, titled Bioengineered Brains to Model Disease and <laughs> Cognition. Take it away, Dr. Rulo. Sorry about that technical issue. I just accidentally muted um, Dr. Rulo. We're just updating that now. My apologies. Hello, everyone. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Beautiful, beautiful. Perfect. Awesome. Fantastic. So I'll just jump right into it and I'll share my screen with you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. I think so. Okay, fantastic. Excellent. So my name is Dr. Nicholas Rulo. I am junior faculty and assistant professor in the Department of Psychology here at Algoma University. And uh, the title of my presentation is Bioengineered Brains to Model Disease and Cognition. It's been very difficult to start a laboratory in the midst of the pandemic. However, I have been running a, what is it now? I've lost track of time, over 12 month experiment in social isolation. And I'm trying to see um, what the effects are on weight gain and sanity. Um, and it's, it's really, uh, it's becoming something of a, of, of a thing. I'm, I'm, um, I, it's an N of one. Um, I'm, I'm basically running these experiments on myself, um, but I digress. So as for me, I am tormented with an everlasting itch for things remote. I love to sail forbidden seas and land on barbarous coasts. I love this quote from Moby Dick. What it says to me is that we should um, explore frontiers. We should try to push boundaries, especially in science. And the uh, research that I'd like to present to you today is some of the research that I've been putting out in the past couple of years, uh, specifically associated with my postdoctoral fellowship. So how do we study brains? This is a really interesting question on the cutting edge right now. What are the different ways that we can study brains? And we've been doing a lot of conventional things for a very long time. So we've been studying brains from the perspective of looking at non-human animals like lab rats, for example. We look at humans, of course, that's primarily the brain that we're interested in. And then of course, we can look at tissues which come from those brains and cells, which are again, derived from those brains. And there's a new approach, a new approach which will allow us to maintain the physiological relevance associated with the human brain and the brains of organisms, but we'll be able to actually investigate it at a granular level in vitro. In vitro just means in a dish or in glass, and that's the type of thing that cell biologists will use um, to study uh, phenomena in a way that can be micromanaged, in a way that can be very flexible on the experimental level. So neural tissue engineering offers this unique opportunity where you can take really complex phenomena and reduce it down to the basic units. So there's three main types of um, neural engineered tissues. The first is spheroids. These are just a bunch of neural cells packed together into a sphere. The second is organoids where you take stem cells and you allow them to grow up into these uh, extraordinary uh, structures that resemble the fetal brain. Um, and then there's these modular uh, forms of neural tissue engineering where you can very precisely tune exactly what kinds of tissues, what kinds of cells, whether you want vasculature or not, into your tissue. You can create basically brains from scratch. And that's the type that I'm gonna be talking about today. So 
what I've done is um, I've taken these silk biomaterials. These are this is silk uh, materials um, that is that are taken from silkworms, uh, silkworm cocoons specifically. We break it down. We we make all sorts of interesting scaffolds out of them. These are um, little matrices within which neurons can form networks. So we're basically creating a uh, like a playground for the neurons to hang around in, and what you can do then is you can either take stem cells or you can take neurons that are derived from the brains of animals, uh, like the uh, what I'm showing here. So you can take these brain uh, brain cells and you can put them into these scaffolds, these materials that you've uh, made. And so it's basically like taking a sponge and filling it with all sorts of cells, and then they create networks. And the green image here that you see this this um, this GIF that you're looking at is a neural network that has formed inside of one of these sponges. All the blue is silk and all the green, those are the neurons, those are the uh, brain cells. And this is basically the setup. So you have this sponges material, it's filled with these neural networks. And then in the center, you can remove the silk. You have an area that has no silk and all the cells, they'll, they'll form connections uh, via their axons across the, the, the structure. And so you get this really complex, um, neural network that's really small. It's only a couple millimeters across. You can create thousands of these at a time. So as opposed to studying like 30 rats or like five humans, you can study a thousand miniaturized brains in a dish. They're very long living, so they can live up to two and a half years in culture, which means that you can study all sorts of things like chronic disease, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, uh, as well as like uh, looking at the effects of nutrients or pesticides and things like that. This is just an example right here of um, activity inside of these um, miniaturized brains. So I'm just going to press the uh, button here and hopefully you can see this. So this is electrical activity that's moving around the miniaturized brain tissue. So there is in fact a network and there is communication between the different parts of the network. And what you're looking at here is calcium. Calcium is just a marker that we use to look at uh, brain activity, but that's really interesting, isn't it? Okay, let's move on. One of the things that we can do is model diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease is a, is a very, it's a, a truly insidious disorder that affects um, people usually in the, in the upper age ranges, uh, but can affect uh, those of us who are younger. And um, it's, it has all sorts of interesting hallmarks and we can use those hallmarks to model disease. We can create a miniaturized model of Alzheimer's disease and we can use that model to test anti-Alzheimer's drugs. Um, so this is one example of me validating an Alzheimer's miniaturized tissue. So what we were able to find was using the cells from Alzheimer's patients and putting them into these miniaturized tissues, making miniature brains from the brain cells of Alzheimer's patients. Well, in fact, they were skin cells that were transformed to brain cells, but uh, that's just an aside. Um, we can use, uh, we can actually see that they'll form amyloid plaques, which is a ha classic hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. And there is increased rates of phosphorylated tau protein, which is yet another example of a marker for Alzheimer's disease. So, um, and the stress increases, uh, stress markers like um, reactive oxygen species increase inside of these uh, miniaturized brain tissues as well. And here, this is just an example of decreased electrical activity inside of the Alzheimer's, miniaturized Alzheimer tissues. You can see on the bottom right, um, there's a squiggle with less spikes in it. That's the Alzheimer's um, uh, tissue showing less electrical activity. Another thing that we can do, and this is really interesting, is sort of a um, brand new topic in the area of um, uh, neuropathology. There's all sorts of epidemiological data that links HSV, which is uh, herpes simplex virus, particularly HSV1 with Alzheimer's disease. And it, and it turns out that this is pretty robust. It's, it's been replicated over and over and over. But we decided to experimentally test it. So what you do is we can take um, induced neural stem cells and we can infect them with uh, HSV1 and then see what happens. And it turns out that they generate amyloid beta plaques, the plaques that you see in Alzheimer's disease. So being infected with herpes simplex virus one, which by the way, a lot of us are infected with this, but will never have Alzheimer's disease. The question is, how does it actually get to the brain cells? It has to get through the blood brain barrier. And that's a whole mechanism that I'm not really gonna get into, but the fact is that these simple viruses can eventually cause neurological disorders later on in life. 
So the big question that I'm interested in now is, can we reverse engineer cognition? Can we take these miniaturized brain tissues and see if they actually think or can behave or are, can experience something? And one of the major papers that I put out here, and this has just been accepted in the last 48 hours. So this is really new, brand new research. Um, what we did was we, we actually put the miniaturized brain tissues through a habituation paradigm. And we were able to determine that it could learn. And uh, you could actually get a spontaneous recovery of the learning effect as well. And there's synaptic plasticity, which tells you that a memory is being encoded inside of these miniaturized brain tissues. So they are in fact learning and they are forming memories. Um, and it's associated with all sorts of interesting uh, proteins, protein dynamics. Uh, but the question is now, what else can they do? And we just put out a, a review in Trends in Cognitive Sciences, which goes into detail about what kinds of possibilities exist for these types of tissues. What are we looking at? Um, is it possible that we can generate brain tissues to study things like consciousness, really higher order phenomena that we have never been able to study in a dish? And this is a, really a frontier um, aspect of the research. So summary, uh, neural tissue engineering is an emerging powerful tool that can be used to model disease and uncover fundamental features of brain activity. Building brains from scratch to think and behave is a worthwhile pursuit that is possible in principle and now in practice. And there may be fundamental challenges ahead, but an understanding of what allows uh, matter to think and experience is a worthwhile pursuit. These are some of the students that have helped me over the years with this research and they've published alongside me and some funding and collaborators, the people who worked on these projects. And now I'll uh, field some questions if you have them. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rulo. If you can mute your mic while I ask you questions so the audience don't hear uh, feedback since we share a table. Um, I do have a question for you uh, from, sorry, Dr. Rulo, could you mute your mic for a second? Thank you. Uh, yeah, so a question we have here it, it, from Elvis. Uh, do you believe that in centuries and decades to come, humans such as neurosurgeons uh, with the novel research support of neuroscientists or neurobiologists can transplant brains in patients after a brain death if all organs are functioning? I love that question. Thank you, Elvis. So the thing about a brain transplant, unlike other organ transplants, is that you can't really transplant a brain because you are your brain. So if I was to take your brain out and put it into another body, you would effectively be the person in that body. So, and, and what that means, uh, the, the corollary is that you can't accept a brain transplant either, right? If your brain was somehow ravaged by a, um, a chronic disease, a neurodegenerative disease, you can't simply accept a new brain, at least not yet. Because if you were to accept a new brain, the donor would be the person who's in, now in your body. Right, you, you, the, we, we currently don't think that consciousness would, your consciousness would be preserved because consciousness as we know it is generated by the brain itself. Uh, so very unlikely. However, if we were able to design some sort of receptacle for consciousness, um, if consciousness is in fact what is known as substrate independent, can we put it in something else, either a template brain or into a supercomputer or something like that, then perhaps there is a possibility for brain transplants. Great question, and, and thank you for that response, Dr. Rulo. We have another question here from Ms. Thiel, who asks, uh, do you think we can replace certain parts of the brain, such as uh, the area responsible for memory, or potentially could you cure paralysis? Great question. Lots of people working on that sort of thing right now, especially spinal cord injury. It's a relatively straightforward problem. You have axons, which are just the extensions of neurons that are traveling from bottom to top, right? The, the brain all the way down through the spinal cord and then eventually out through the uh, lower motor neurons. Relatively simple solution. You need to simply hook them back up, but there's all sorts of complications, inflammation, uh, actually aligning the, the, the fibers so that there isn't crosstalk, and chronic pain is a, is a serious issue with this, but a lot of people working on it. As to replacing parts of the brain, uh, yes, some of these tissues that I've talked about today, in fact, have been transplanted into animals and can become reintegrated with, for example, the cerebral cortex. So you can integrate these tissues with the cortex. You could, for example, take out a piece of epileptic brain, a, an irritative lesion, a lesion that would normally uh, produce uh, seizures. You can remove that and replace it with normal tissue so that the person no longer experiences seizures. 
I think we do have uh, one more quick question um, from Sawith. The exact causes of uh, Alzheimer's is unknown. So does this mean that HSV could be a potential cause since it leads to the formation of amyloid beta plaques, which is a present in Alzheimer's as well? Great question, Sawith. So um, it's very unlikely that HSV-1 is the sole cause of Alzheimer's disease. Um, that's extremely unlikely. I, in fact, I, I, would, I would go as far as to say that that's not the case. There are very likely many causes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, it turns out that familial Alzheimer's disease, which is the strong genetic inherited version of Alzheimer's disease, is actually in the minority of cases. Um, most of them are what is called uh, cryptogenic or acquired or sporadic. So they, they're acquired over the course of one's life. A virus will do it. Um, there's other sorts of disorders that'll do it. Um, any, a mutagen will do it as well, right? Um, but yeah, it, it's one potential cause of many possible causes of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we've actually successfully wrapped up the faculty lunchbox talks. And I want to take a moment to thank um, all of our speakers, Dr. Aziz, Dr. Steves, Dr. Antunes, Dr. Akadola, and Dr. Rulo for your time, and all of you guys, the audience, for attending, listening, learning, and uh, asking questions. I do want to pass the floor to our uh, president, uh, uh, Asma, for some final thoughts and some final words as well. I think we just may have lost her connection. Let me double check here. Oh, it looks like she just popped out about two minutes ago. She must have had another meeting. So Narosha, if you want to finish up, that would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I said I think that's all I have to say. Again, thank you so much uh, for joining. We do have another uh, session like one of these. I think this is great to get an idea of what everyone's working on, opportunities for students as well. So join us on Thursday for another set of faculty talks. Tomorrow we do have a keynote uh, from Dr. Amanda Rowe, who's going to be talking about her research from the Great Lake Forestry Center. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, if you have any questions, again, shoot us an email at research office or use the contact form. Thank you again, and have a great rest of your day. Bye.